Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name's Leona, and on the behalf of everyone at Better Red Than Dead, we are so pleased to welcome you on Zoom to celebrate Josephine Taylor's new release, Eye of a Rook. Um, Josephine is joined in conversation by Cassandra Atherton. Before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. These will be different depending on where you're zooming in from. For me, it is the land of the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that Better Red Than Dead is built. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And now to our guests. Um, Josephine Taylor is a writer and freelance editor who lives on the coast north of Perth, Western Australia. She is associate editor at Westerly Magazine and an adjunct senior lecturer at writing at Edith Cohen University. Josephine teaches, facilitates and judges in literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Her personal essays in fiction have been anthologized and published in journals including Axon, NC, Outskirts, Sudley, Text and Westerly. Her debut novel, which we're celebrating today, is called Eye of a Rook. Cassandra Atherton is a widely anthologized prose poet and an expert in prose poetry. She was a visiting scholar in English at Harvard University and a visiting fellow at Sophia University in Tokyo. She is the recipient of national and international research grants and awards and has judged numerous poetry awards, including the Victoria's Prize, uh, Premier's Prize for Poetry, the Joanne Burns Award and the Lord Mayo's Prize for Poetry. Cassandra's books of prose poetry include Exhumed, Trace, Pre-Raphaelite and Leftovers. She's an associate professor of writing and literature at Deakin University and commissioning editor for the Westerly magazine, Axon, and a series editor for Publishers, Spineless Wonders. The last little thing before we get started, just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. You'll notice that there's a mute or unmute button on the lower left corner of your screen, um, which we ask that you keep on mute just to prevent feedback and background noise from disrupting the proceedings. When we move to the Q&A, which is towards the end of the chat, like 7 or 7.15, um, please type your questions into the group chat and Josephine and Cassandra will answer them via video when the time comes. You can pre-order a copy of Ivor Rook on our website, it's front and centre. And without further ado, here are Josephine and Cassandra. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's an absolute joy to be chatting to Jo, who I know from Westerly and I also know um, for those of you that have seen her socials she has an amazing red kitchen but that's another whole story uh, and I'm reading I'm wearing red today to uh, to acknowledge not only her kitchen but this amazing book and it is such an incredible book you can tell from all of my color coordinated notes um, that I got so much out of it it's so haunting Joe it's so poetic it's so indelible and it makes my life easy when I have to chat with people about something that I genuinely love so I wanted to start with congratulations and then I guess my second thing was it's International Women's Day so it's the perfect opportunity for us to have a talk about the amazing women in this book that you've created and some of the problems that they have uh, have managed to live with and work with throughout their lives. Um, so just to quickly uh, fill in people who may not know that much about this book, there are two incredible women, um, one in contemporary Perth, the other is a Victorian woman, and they both share a huge disruption to their lives, um, the onset of vulvodynia. But it's much more than that. Um, it's about their textured and fascinating lives. It's how they live in their respective worlds and how they overlap. Um, and I've said before, I think I said to you, Joe, one of my favorite books is The French Lieutenant's Woman. And I think this is just the most amazing kind of um, different look at the use of juxtapositions in that kind of John Fowles way. So without further ado, I want to start with Alice and Emmy. I feel like I live with them now. So you've got these two amazing women. They're brilliant. Um, I love them both. Could we start with Alice? Because she's the contemporary character. And maybe you could talk a little bit about her and the fact your name's Alice, which is always reminiscent of Alice in Wonderland for me. How did you come up with Alice? Okay, sure. Well, Alice, uh, like me, is um, living and, and working and writing on, on Wajuk, Wajuk Noongar country. So that's um, one thing that connects us. She's kind of living where I live. Um, I guess what I'd say about Alice is I, I've given her a lot of my own experiences mm -hmm with Vovodinia, but she's also a very different person from me. Um, so she, what I did was I took her period of time where she's trying to find out what this 
thing is that she has, which initially she just has no words for because nobody knows what it is. Um, and so for her, what she does is she starts to research the history of hysteria and the history of vulvar pain, uh, which is exactly what I did. So I was kind of a bit cheeky. What I did was I um, set Alice in the period when I did my PhD mm -hmm. so that I wouldn't have to do any more research. <laughs> <laughs> So that was so it meant that everything that she experiences there is kind of current and, and correct for that time. Uh, so, yeah, um, look, I, I made her similar to me in that she's a researcher and writer. She's different to me in that she's substantially younger. Um, and I did that for a few reasons. So she's she's been married to her considerably older partner, Duncan for some time mm -hmm. and um, she is at a point where she's actually also thinking about having babies and so on and they have talked about this and no but you know she's still got this all this, this feeling starting to rise in her again and I this is actually something that that women with vulvodynia do struggle a lot with so I wanted to make her younger for that reason uh, but, yeah, the Alice thing, it's really funny because um, I know you love Alice in Wonderland and my favourite book when I was young was Alice Through the Looking Glass. <laughs> ah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, The Other Side. The Other Side yeah. of the Glass. There you go. Hey, so I really loved the way in Alice Through the Looking Glass, how when she first goes through it, because it's like a mirror, she, wherever she tries to get to, she goes in the opposite direction. Yeah. And um, so she has to kind of start to, to learn the laws of the, the mirror kind of that she's gone into. Um, and I think that that's the same for Alice is that she's yeah. kind of um, trying to get somewhere but constantly almost going backwards. So research is her way of trying to find out what's going on and what she can do about it. And she grows up, doesn't she, over the course of the book? You know, like she starts off in her relationship with Duncan and she feels like a woman who's been quite empowered and she's made a decision to be with this older man who I think was also her tutor at university. Is that right? So, That's right. you know, and she argues, you know, and says, no, like this seems like a stereotypical situation, but I understand that. I'm an intellectual. I made this decision. It's not what you think it is. And then she starts to reevaluate that as she starts doing research and as she starts even understanding, you know, what she, who she is and what that means in terms of dealing with kind of chronic pain. Um, can, yeah, maybe yeah. just talk a little bit about Alice and Duncan um, yeah. and, and how their relationship is presented. Mm. Yeah, look, I think that. Um, for me, at least, when I was writing it, I felt like she made the right decisions when she made them. So she changed. So, like, it was right for her at that time to be with Duncan and they had, you know, have had and have a, a very rich and rewarding relationships in many ways. Um, so I guess there's that whole thing about in our lives there, you know, we, we it's easy to kind of look back and say oh, that was a wrong decision where actually it probably wasn't. It was kind of the right decision at the time. It's just that you change. So what happens is that, uh, and, and again, this is something that was really important to me because of um, what I know from other women with vulvodynia and I've had um, connection with hundreds and hundreds of, of women in that situation now, is that it's not necessarily the vulvodynia that, that kind of is the sort of the thing that makes the relationship mm. impossible or difficult. It's often who you become. So I really sort of took that to the kind of, um, nth degree with Alice in that her pain is so severe um, and again with vulvodynia we've, we've talked about this before but um, it can range from very sort of like discomfort with uh, tampon insertion intercourse right through to the sort of constant debilitating spontaneous pain that Alice has because she has that um, and, and similar to me though I'm a lot a lot better these days thank goodness um, yeah yeah because she has that, she can't, she, she fights it. You know, she does fight it for some time. She just wants to go back to who she was before. Yeah. She was very happy with who she was before. She was very happy in her marriage with Duncan. And um, though there's some uneasiness around, around the relationship, nothing, no more than there might be in any relationship. So I think it's the kind of the relentlessness of the pain that makes her eventually, and the fact that fighting it gets her nowhere, that she can't, um, yeah, it, it doesn't improve the pain, 
um, she realizes, okay, I actually have to listen to this pain. I have to follow it. Um, and in the process, she, her mother is, she's quite estranged from her mother, who's a Jungian analyst, a depth mm -hmm. psychotherapist. Um, and in, in that process, um, she starts to kind of take on or, or think about um, things in a slightly different way, for instance, from like from her mother's perspective. So, yeah, she and the relationships with everybody in her life change as well, including, you know, Duncan. Absolutely. And we've talked about that point, too, that, you know, she was the book opens and she's incredibly happy. You know, she has a great sex life. Like it's awesome sex scene, by the way. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> love it. Um, you know, and but it's it's a real it's joy. You know, it's not about, um, you know, even moments that I feel so bad for Alice, there's sort of um, the knowledge of how this affects every facet of her life, like even the fact she can't even sit properly at various points, you know, and, and it's sort of these peaks and troughs in her life that she starts to kind of work out and reinforce through um, research, which, you know, knowledge is power. She becomes, you know, really dedicated to that. And I think that's so interesting that Duncan, you know, who comes from this university experience as well, can't see that what she's doing is, you know, supporting her and experience through kind of understanding and listening to kind of the theorizing about it. And then of course we jump to the 1860s and Emmy, as I like to call her, because that's her kind of, you know, little diminutive of, yeah. of Emily. Um, you know, and I, I guess, like Alice, there's this extreme joy, you know, at her at her relationship and the proposal from Arthur and the fact that, um, you know, they're pretty hot for one another for the period of time <laughs> they're in, right? It's like pretty hot. I'm like, whoa, this is pretty good. Um, but you know, there are equally problems. Um, and there are there's the Volvodinia that comes in and starts to change their relationship and the way that they deal with it as a couple. And I think we've talked about the fact I love the, the way that Arthur is, you know, is so supportive of her, but she also has this other side where she communicates um, with her sister-in-law to be and, and writes amazing letters that um, fit historically so beautifully into the time she's living in, but also reveal so much about what's going on and how conflicted she is about this relationship that gives her so much joy and yet this pain, you know, that is underpinning her experience. Um, so yeah, Women's International Women's Day. Now I want to know about Emmy and um, and even I think if you tell us a bit about her and then read a letter for us so we can get into her head and into her voice, which is so special in this book. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Look, I had so much fun writing her letters. <laughs> it was sheer indulgence for me, you know, just, yeah, playing with the language and everything. I actually have a book, I should have got it out, um, of letters from that time, oh, women. Wow. Yeah, um, Pat Jelland, I think, wrote it. Uh, and it's just great. So I've read that several times and I think it was just a great way of me really um, building that kind of language and mentality and everything, as well as researching Victorian England to a ridiculous <laughs> yeah. degree um, and reading everything I could possibly think of. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think that, 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 yes, one thing that links the two couples certainly is this thing that um, that their, their sexuality is strong and healthy um, in both cases. And, and, again, that for me was something important because... I think that I was pushing against this idea, this sort of history of seeing female pain in that area as a sexual disorder. Yeah. So I really wanted to make it clear that in most cases there's actually sort of no real precursors. And um, so, yeah, that was that was important. Um, so, Emily, um, I, I remember at one point Susan Medalia, who's my fabulous mentor, yeah. Um, she said, oh, look, I think you might be making her a little bit, um, I don't know if she said, use the word dumb, but, you know, you, she, she's, surely would, would he be attracted to her if she was, you know, can you add a bit of depth? Um, and so that was actually really important in creating a more complex voice, I think, for Alice. And also that then she can have these conversations with B, who initially, I mean, as you do when you write a novel, you have all of these chapters you don't use. So B actually sort of becomes a suffragette and, you know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so she's very early in that. And I wanted with that to kind of um, show the differences between the women as well in that era. And uh, maybe this, this letter might um, illustrate that quite well. I also had real fun in um, 
making the correspondence incredibly formal to begin with yeah. and then just gradually relaxing. So February the 27th, 1865. My dear B, thank you for answering my questions when I feared you might find them too presumptuous. I see now that we are different. While your independence is valuable to you, critical, you say, I wish to devote myself above all to the domestic life and the sanctity of marriage. My goal is to be the best wife and mother it's possible to be, by understanding my husband's work and discussing what is important to us both. While yours is to constantly develop your intellect and to use your knowledge of social and political matters to question what is established, even to challenge this. But I'm glad you have not discounted love entirely. You have many years ahead to change your mind, as you say. I can vouch for the contentment of married life and can confirm that while I'm not as free to make choices as you or to carry them out, Arthur considers me in every important decision. It is a blessing to imagine our future years together and to continually discover that we are happily suited in all things. Are you bored with me yet? Has my constant eulogising of your brother and our happiness wearied you? I will not apologise. Oh, B, how contented I feel to be part of the Rochdale family. I cannot imagine greater happiness than this. Your M. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's wonderful. And I love too, like it enfolds B into it and gives women more than one role, you know, and it also says it's okay if you want to get married, but it's okay if you don't, you know, and it sort of folds those women together in that narrative where they understand one another and they respect one another for their own kind of decisions. Which I guess leads us to Duncan and Arthur. Now, you know, I have a very soft spot for Arthur. He is adorable. Um, and, you know, part of that is his unequivocal support, you know, of Emmy and his love of Emmy. But, you know, Duncan tries. You know, there, there is there is some real affection and some some real moments where he gets close to to understanding and trying to support her um, but they're different men in different times and I think sometimes we almost thought it would go the other way you know that that Duncan would be the more progressive one and, and Arthur would be more I guess the kind of Victorian man of his time that didn't listen to his wife so much and made decisions based on conversations with you know her father and and the kind of men or the patriarchy um, so Maybe if you could talk a little bit about different kinds of masculinity. I mean, this is all bound up in International Women's Day as well. You know, is is about um, is about men in some ways and their their approach. Mm, absolutely, men's responses to women yeah. and how we and how we interact. Absolutely. Look, I, I felt frustrated frustrated writing um, Duncan a lot. So you know, I can imagine how it's frustrating to read because yeah, look, I agree. And there's times where there's just such tenderness between them. And I mean, I, I won't sort of give anything away about, you know, no. where their relationship goes either. Um, you can see that that both directions are possible. Uh, but yeah, he has to kind of really step up if he's going to kind of, um, if they're going to make it work. Um, she can't go back to who she was before. So really, the pressure is on him, uh, you know, once you really get into the book. Look, Arthur came to me, we've talked about before about this whole thing of that you write intuitively, and then you look back and you think, oh, that's why I did that. Um, and you can see why the decisions that you made intuitively make perfect sense and how kind of important they are to what you're trying to, to do with, um, with your, you know, your, your intent with writing the novel. So Arthur did come to me with no planning at a, at a writing workshop with a writing prompt and I'm suddenly in this room with um, Arthur who's consulting with Isaac Baker Brown. Um, and yeah, and it just went from there. So that became a short story, which then became the first chapter of this book. Um, but I realised, you know, as I was working with Arthur, that I quite liked the the kind of idea that he was more what we would think of as a modern man. Yeah. And that, um, you know, Duncan in many ways, with his kind of emphasis on Hemingway and everything. <laughs> he does love the male writers, doesn't he? <laughs> He's kind of sort of really st stuck in that in a lot of ways. So I, can't, I, I wanted to challenge our ideas and our stereotypes around masculinity um, and around how we thought, think about Victorian men as well um, and to, for us to understand that humans are humans we might live in very distinct um, historical eras, but there are certain kinds of behaviours that are possible regardless of social mores and conventions. 
So um, it was important to me to bring that out. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm so glad that you, that you love Arthur. I, I did too, and I did actually really fall in love with him. I got stuck in the first couple of chapters of his childhood forever <laughs> until somebody said to me, you know, you've, you've actually got to write the book. Um, so yeah, it was really... Um, but he was very, very based on my father um, and on my oh, son. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't very, know very, that. Yeah. So Dad actually died two months before I finished the final draft. So I had a lot of conversations with him in his last year or so and about his childhood and his experiences at boarding school. So he had very similar experience to Arthur. And I used that um, in the book and it was kind of redemptive in some way, I think, for Dad. Um, and also I think that it's about motherhood as well. So, you know, um, Duncan and his mother, Ina, same name as my Ina. mother. Yeah. So Duncan and his mother, Ina, uh, have a difficult relationship. They love each other dearly, but she senses that he blames her for certain things that she did when he was young, which she really didn't have any power over anyway. But um, so their, their relationship is quite tense. Um, Arthur's with his mother is in, in very, very close, very loving. And she actually really helps him to see at a very young age how important it is to have compassion yeah. and how important it is how love is actually about, at a certain point, putting someone else first. So the book is also about motherhood in that yeah. way. Mm. And she has, and Alice has a really close relationship with her mother-in-law. Like they meet up a lot. And I mean, a little bit later on, we're going to talk about the significance of the past. You know, that's that's part of the family kind of history. But um, she almost tells Alice that she is the closest she's going to get to um, sort of Duncan opening up. Like she understands her son's issues but you know she can't there's nothing she can do about them she's tried and she can see it all unfolding and she wants to maintain this kind of close relationship um to Alice even though yeah. she can see things unraveling at various points and she wishes there was something she can do about it so it's a really powerful relationship between two really intelligent women who both love Duncan in different ways for different reasons um and try and communicate about that I think Mm, absolutely yeah she she sees his limitations as as Alice gradually does uh, but yeah it doesn't mean she uh yeah as you say loves him any less and in fact there's th these difficulties between he and Alice that will hopefully you know open that door as well between mother and son um yeah so so Alice finds out about Isaac Baker Brown a surgeon and some of those bits in the book my goodness my eyes were like both glued to the page and horrified by what I was reading especially because you know that they're real historical moments um, and that these things actually happened um, and so I know that he became a bit of a research obsession for you you've written about him um, I read a wonderful kind of article that you read and and story that you've you've written associated with your research on, on Baker Brown, but I thought you might tell us a little bit about him and why he's important in the novel. And um, and you've got to read us a like challenging gory bit from somewhere because there's something about the shock of it that makes you realize these things actually happen. They're not yeah. fiction. They're, they're moments where we are horrified, but there were women who suffered so greatly at the hands of, of science and medicine, you know, in, in Baker Brown's period. It's a really tough one because I don't like to um, upset people, but at the same time, it seemed to me that it was just critical that, you know, this is real, this happened. Um, and so, you know, people need to know about this. Not only, but, you know, and it's not ancient history. It's, yeah. it, there are elements in there that are still alive today. So um, whilst it's difficult to be confronting and I find the material shocking, I also, as a researcher, it was just like gold to me. To <laughs> I got his little book and um, I, I, I received it from a, an Eastern States University. And after I'd had it a couple of weeks, I um, and was just like, oh, my goodness, just compelled by all of these cases of women that he'd, um, you know, so the content warning coming up, guys, but um, that he performed clitoridectomies on and pronounced cured. Um, usually after the operation, they'd have a straight jacket or they'd be restrained in some way because basically um, the idea was with him, he talked about peripheral irritation. Um, I won't actually go into that too much because it's, I'll, I'll read that extract and it'll make it clear. 
Um, but yeah, so what I happened after a little while is that I had had a, the book for a little while and then I actually accidentally found a dedication sort of hidden in the front page, which was quite closely stuck to the, the, the cover. And um, well, it wasn't stuck, but it was sort of just kept falling against it. So I opened it out and I found, oh, I Baker Brown. And I realised it was actually a handwritten dedication oh. from Isaac Baker Brown. Yeah, so then I had to, of course, because I'm a researcher, I had to try and work out who it was made out yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> so that took years of kind of, um, you know, to, you know, not all the time, but just no. going back to it again, going back to it again in between teaching and everything um, and gradually working out eventually that it's his son. The book is dedicated to his son who was working as a surgeon initially in New South Wales. And I, so I, I had all this in the book, and again, Susan, <laughs> well, like I, I've lost track because his name was Arthur, the son. She said, There's just too many Arthurs. I don't Arthur. know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. So in the end, I thought, okay, I'll write a personal essay about Isaac Baker Brown and my ambivalence about him. And so that's what I did because, you know, Alice is ambivalent. So I'm perhaps more ambivalent in the sense I was allowed to be more ambivalent. and. I think I also built the ambivalence into the men's response to him in the Victorian timeline as well. Um, Emmy's father is a physician and he's quite supportive of Isaac yeah. Baker Brown. So I wanted to build in this idea that, yes, he's, he's a human being and so on, um, but he did these terrible things. So, I, yeah, look, I'll, I'll read a little extract from um, page 158. It's great too. I mean, um, it's hard to accept them because they fit so wonderfully in the book and they're not gratuitous. They actually fit into, you know, the mindset of the time and, you know, Alice understanding Emmy's time, you know, and what's, and what's going on. So, um, so yeah, so I'm wanting you to read them partly for that um, understanding of the horror of it, but also understanding that um, it was sort of commonplace in a really terrible way. A terrible way that that we struggle I think in contemporary society to think that these things happen with Absolutely. father's blessings right like you know the yeah. fathers are all like yeah. yeah go ahead do it on occasion I mean often he wouldn't tell women that the operation was being performed they wouldn't yeah. know ahead of time but also sometimes and, and women had other operations for hysteria because that's what um Alice is told that you know she has yeah. Yeah. um but and and sometimes women too wanted to kind of or so the research has told me, um, had had their own ambivalence and they kind of wanted to fit the model of docility yeah. that was demanded of them as well as Victorian wives. Yeah. So she's just picked up the book, um, Isaac Baker Brown's book from the library. And she's only seen a short extract um, from about Isaac Baker Brown on the internet before and now she's got the book. And the book is called on the curability of certain forms of insanity, epilepsy, catalepsy and hysteria in females by I. Baker Brown. So the yellowing fat page is fanned and settled. And she's reading now. Long and frequent observation convinced me that a large number of affections peculiar to females depended on loss of nerve power and that this was produced by peripheral irritation arising originally in some branches of the pudic nerve. More particularly, the incident nerve supplying the clitoris. Pudic nerve? Maybe that was the pudendal nerve. Peripheral irritation? Probably masturbation. She'd been reading other 19th century texts that expressed moral horror over the practice, had seen that on occasion women themselves acquiesced to certain forms of treatment, even operations, wanting to be rid of a lust that troubled Victorian society's notions of what a gentlewoman should be. Docile modest, asexual somehow. She flicked, flicked through some more pages. The clitoris is freely excised either by scissors or knife. I always prefer the scissors. A sympathetic stab in her fanny. She rolled onto her side and pushed a pillow between her thighs. So the operation was Baker Brown's solution for hysteria and all the associated downward spiraling conditions, spiral irritate, spinal irritation, hysterical epilepsy, Idiotcy, a spelling mistake here perhaps, a hint of the farmer behind the surgeon, and the last, death. This was how he fixed them, by removing the problem, by removing the clitoris. She kept reading, thinking, stopping each time words snagged her. I've been met with many objections, such as unsexing the female. 
protests from physicians and also the surgeons from the looks, but no give in Baker Brown's certain, almost strident voice. Irritation about vulva, perineum and anus. Sometimes she has to pass her water every half hour. For the last three years, the act of coition has been accomplished without the least pleasure, but with pain. Vestibulodynia, a recurring UTI. Subject to fits of violent excitement, she would fly at him and rend his skin like a tigress. Became in every respect a good wife. What choice did she have? What else might they do if she didn't behave? Six years she had been confined to a spinal couch, so forward and open in her manners that she was generally avoided by gentlemen, never had an offer of marriage. The phrase italicised, emphasised, as if it were out of the ordinary, a terrible, shameful thing. I love that, a terrible, shameful thing. It sums it up so beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I still... I still find those moments so raw and, and really contextualise what's happening for these women. But on, but on a brighter note, Alice does have, you know, an incredible support group of women who are all sufferers of vulvodynia. And, and as you've said, you know, vulvodynia is suffered by different women in different ways for different periods of time. And, and every, everyone has a relatively unique experience within that sort of spectrum of chronic pain. Um, can you talk a little bit about creating the women in her support group and what, what you wanted from that as, as a writer? Like, why, why did you give these women to Alice and, and what was their function? Mm. This one was a very deliberate decision, quite a conscious decision that um, I, it, was, it was, as I was writing the narrative, I had these two women with, this, with the same pain, basically. They both have the same form of vulvodynia. They both experience it very similarly. And I was really conscious that, as far as I know, this is the first fictional representation of women with vulvodynia. So I haven't seen any other novels with, with yeah. women. Yeah, so um, a, a kind of strange first. Uh, so I didn't want to misrepresent it. Uh, I wanted there to be representations of women with different forms of pain. And also I, I did have a support group. I started a support group in Perth many years ago. Uh, and still um, in close contact with women from the group who came to my launch, so that was lovely. Um, quietly, quietly, invisibly, they came. Um, so the women in this support group have varying levels of pain. I also wanted to show that women um, have different causes. So they have, they all have different causes for the pain. Some of them it's a UTI, some of them might be a fall, or it might be um, diet, or it's something to do with hormones. Um, it might be dermatological, um, it might be pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, central nervous system problem. So I really wanted to kind of um, expose the full gamut of kind of causes and forms of maintenance, why it stays, the kind of all the different kinds of treatments, because there's not one single thing that helps everybody. In fact, some treatments hurt women, yeah. um, some women. So it was really important to kind of give that variety. And, you know, look, I wanted to talk to you, particularly Cassandra, because I really wanted to talk about the aesthetics of the book. But I also knew that you'd understand that I, I did write this with an agenda. I did write it with an intent. I, I was quite passionate about letting people know this. This is a thing, people. Yeah. <laughs> You've got yeah. to know about it. So, um, and some of the women in the group are really angry. Um, you know, so again, I could sort of farm out all these different emotions. <laughs> And I could also use um, the support group, I guess, the women in the support group, some of them have experiences that I've had. Um, some of the, some of Alice's experiences are taken from the support group that I was in. Um, so it was able, I was able to kind of give myself that kind of freedom as a, as a fiction writer to not stick too close to my own story as well. So the support group and, and also just that, like you say, International Women's Day, just this amazing support that they offer and it's unquestioning. Um, the men are never there, not because, you know, they don't have good relationships. A lot of them do, but just simply because it's for the women. And they are able to, and they do, <laughs> they can get pretty raunchy. So they yeah. can sort of, you know, speak about anything um, as you do. Yeah. 
And it seems like vulvodynia is and an, a, a range, I guess, of associated problems that have been denoted women's problems, even though you were telling me, you know, it's not just, you know, something that women suffer from, but they're almost a taboo conversation, right? So you have these incredible moments where the support group are talking about things in someone's, you know, one of the women's houses and, you know, they, they come together and it's an incredible relief for the reader because there's this discussion happening that you don't hear in public. Um, mm. And this is sort of that, linchpin moment where I'm kind of hoping that that the discussion in the book is something that will give women permission to talk about it a little bit more in in public and not feel and there is a lot of shame I think you know it's it's the idea too that it's um that it's linked up with something like not wanting to have sex or having issues with sex but it's it's not you know it's I think you've explained it differently you know when we say we've got a headache or something you know it doesn't yeah, yeah, that's right. We don't like if you have like um, a problem, if you have recurrent headaches, we don't say, well, she has a thinking disorder. Okay. Or if somebody has corns all over their feet, we don't say, well, they have a walking disorder. I love that. So yeah. It's, no. yeah, so it's just it's a pain disorder. It happens to be situated in that part of the body. Yeah. So for me, I, I think initially, and, and this is the case for a lot of the women in the group too, who do who are prepared to speak perhaps, yeah. is that the anger sort of overcomes the shame because you just really, this is like just, this is ridiculous. Um, for myself, I think that um, my confidence has just grown just because I've had such positive reactions the whole way through. I've not had one single negative reaction. And I also do get a lot of women approaching me yeah. after talks, men as well. So um, I can't remember where we were going with that. Oh, just that, you know, in some ways, I think you've talked about yourself as possibly a spokesperson for Volvo yes. just because, um, you, as you said before, it doesn't seem that there's a kind of fictional account in quite the same way as you've, you've ever managed. And so you've also got a kind of responsibility beyond the bounds of the fictional novel. Yeah, yeah. so I, I do. I do, have, I do feel that sense of responsibility. I don't know why, but I just do. And I know well, you're bringing yeah. it to light. You know, you're you're one of the people that's um, starting a conversation, and I think conversations are the most important thing. You know, because it's where yeah. things happen. You know, we talk, but then hopefully from that discussion, you know, we we move forward. Absolutely, and absolutely. And I, I think too, there's the whole thing. Like there have been quite a lot of books, self help and informational kind yeah. of books published on this. But there's something really important about those kinds of narratives that are informed by the imagination as well. Yeah. Um, the narratives around vulvodynia or talking discourse around vulvodynia can be um, not just limited to kind of medical ways of looking at it or, um, yeah. but, and, and it is, it's getting out there more and more. Um, but yeah, I, I do feel a responsibility and I do hope that more women speak up. It, it certainly changed in the time that I've had vulvodynia, you know, it's become much more out there. I've got this, for instance. Um, this is a new, a new zine. So oh, this is wow. for me from the US. Um, yes. Opening up, yeah. Wow. So, and there's podcasts and there's people on Instagram who do all these fantastic videos of kind of pelvic dancing and <laughs> all That's sorts amazing. of things. So it's definitely happening. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I, that feeds beautifully into, into the question I have about why why fiction? You know, you've talked about the fact that you suffer vulvodynia. You've talked about the fact that, you know, there are many crossovers in Alice's life to your life. Why not memoir or creative nonfiction? Why, what did fiction do for you that perhaps the others didn't or that they did something different and you wanted to focus on the fictional part of this? Mm. Look, um, my PhD was an investigative memoir and it was it ended up being um, that the creative and the um, exegetical components were all jumbled in together and it makes it sound chaotic. It's actually, well, it won prizes, so clearly it's kind of good in that, in that it's a, a, a great piece of research and, uh, yeah, obviously put my heart and soul into it. But when I finished, I did have a bit of a beast, a very big beast, and... I took it to a few publishers and um, I had a lot of interest but no kind of commitment. Um, I, and I, I lose confidence very quickly and easily, so I kind of just put it aside and continued to um, publish personal essays from it. Mm -hmm. So then um, I met Susan Medalia uh, and I sort of just thought she was just amazing and I she thought I'm going <laughs> to woo this woman so I, I sort of 
got her email address from her and sent her a piece to be assessed and um which was from a, was a personal essay and she um said in response she wrote basically that you know you could actually you, she was very complimentary she said you could also if you if you wanted to um, write fiction from this and I had never considered writing fiction before actually um I haven't written fiction I hadn't written any fiction at that stage mm. yeah 2012 2013 so I learned to write fiction by writing I have a rook so yeah I, I then then I had that situation in the workshop and that and that in um conversation just came spontaneously up and I just thought okay there's something here and that's how I began the the short story that then went became the novel um but yeah I think that I'm actually really you know how you kind of look back at things and you say I'm really yeah. glad that it worked out that way but I am really glad that it worked out that way because I wouldn't have written this novel if the, the memoir had been picked up and I don't if I don't know that it was quite the time then to be honest yeah. I think yeah. like now we've got all these um sort of wonderful books I've got a stack of them there but sort of you know all of these fantastic mm -hmm. books sorry I'm trying to tilt it the right way oh no, yeah we can see them yeah it's just it's a mirror thing isn't it so I kind of there you go so Carly Maslin and um Katarina Bryant Gabriel John Jackson Tegan Bennett Daylight yeah. Nicole Redhouse so many of them um so and they've only come out more recently uh, so I think it might have actually been a little bit early anyway but yes I, it's forced me it forced me to kind of write the novel and and I'm so thrilled now yeah. that that is the case because it's unique and nobody would you know you could write similar kinds of memoirs in some ways but this is kind of nobody would ever write this novel yeah and I don't I think maybe with memoir you're kind of you know stuck with the facts of your own life without being able to stray too far from that um, and also and looking after them. other people yeah that, yeah absolutely you've got the whole thing of um yeah so I, you do you have this whole thing about kind of having to be you know faithful to what happened yeah. represented accurately and i'm very much like that anyway um but i also had that sense of oh gosh having to get permission from everyone and that was difficult enough with ethics um mainly with friends and you know yeah so it was that was really contentious yeah. yeah difficult absolutely and one of one of the other ways i guess that you have framed the novel is to bring in people like freud and charcot and sort of represent not in a theory heavy way in a really enlightening exciting way you know you bring in people who've been considered at various points you know experts um, um in their discussion and, and dealings with women um, and how we think about them today is very different from how they were thought about in their time. But I link that to the wonderful image that becomes a real motif throughout the book of, of the purse um, and, how, you know, and, and, and the moment, you know, that, that Freud and the purse is linked and it's such a clever, clever moment, but it's something that Alice takes with her, you know, throughout all of her experiences and comes back to and rethinks it and, and looks at what it means and all of that. Um, so maybe if you could just let us know a little bit about why bring in people like Freud and Charcot. And you said Jung before, you know, because Alice's mother has, you know, that that role in the book too. And um, and how does that link to the purse? And maybe you could read a bit about the purse for us. Sure. And then I'll ask people if they've got questions. Okay. So um all right. Freud had to be in there just because he has been so influential and because he still is and because um, I'm really interested when I read these articles and books about, you know, is Freud dead kind of thing? You know, the articles saying this. Um, and I think, well, no, no, Freud's actually not deeply, deeply embedded, quite invisible, quite, um, you know, ingrained in our attitudes where if something's a physical problem that there's no medical explanation that we think oh what happened in their childhood what's the past or have they got some you know secondary gain that's associated with it um whereas you know uh the diagnostic and statistical manual of psychiatric disorders or mental disorders dsm anyway the psychiatric handbook that's um acknowledged that uh, a lot of conditions that was were seen as conversion hysteria or, or conversion syndrome actually ended up having medical um, causes. So I think that the, the what's happened because of Freud and that kind of influence that, um, that yes, there's, if you can't fix it, it's kind of your fault, um, yeah. unconscious, yeah. you know, but, but still. Um, if you're a woman, it's further complicated by the fact that your sexual development is driven by envy for the penis. 
<laughs> yeah, really. Um, so, um, and she, yeah. So um, I think that there's a whole stack of things about Freud that I just find fascinating. And I think we've both said that we really like some elements of his work. I just think I love, I love a lot of his writing and he was just mind-blowing in a lot of ways, but so much damage for women with Slovodinia. I mean, other things as well, but particularly women with Slovodinia because that kind of psychiatric thing, um, Alice talks about it with one of the women in the support group, is that, you know, um, that they're seen as uh, all these articles come out that see it as psychiatric, yeah. that see it as a defence complex, et cetera. Charcot, um, so Charcot was earlier and I really like Charcot. I find him fascinating. I think he really understood. I mean, I don't know that I, I like the way he treated the hysterics yeah. in some ways, yeah. but I really liked his ideas around um, hysteria and the way in which he saw it as a nervous system problem because I think we're only reaching that again now in the sense of things yeah. like fibromyalgia and so on, yeah. um, constant permanent um, persistent pain syndromes that we're seeing them more as a nervous system problem, a central nervous system problem. So I'll read out this little bit anyway where Dora, uh, Dora <laughs> where um, Alice has met up with Enoch Duncan's mother and they're having a, a coffee and they're talking about the interesting things that they usually talk about, if I can find it. I love the purse. It's such a romantic gesture at the beginning that I think the reader doesn't quite work it out. And then when it comes back, you know, it gives so much depth to her, you know, Alice's story. And it's another historical artifact. It's connecting those two periods of time, which beautifully, no spoilers, you know, managed to meld in certain ways. But it's one of those little hints with the with the past that the history yeah. of contemporary are, you know. Thank you. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. Yeah, so it was called Silk Purse at one point. Ah, um, yeah. yeah, and originally I, I wrote it under the working title of Silk Purse. Uh, and yes, it, it's um, Duncan gives it to um, Emily, uh, sorry, to Alice, and um, Arthur gives it to Emily as well. So there's a, they're, they're linked through this purse. <clears throat> but she meets up with Ina and she's really interested in knowing about the purse and they have a bit of conversation about it. And then she says, I've been thinking a lot about purses lately. She said, it must be all the Freud I'm reading. Ina laughed. I can guess what Freud made of purses. Because of her approachability, perhaps, or the aroma of warm biscuit dough that seemed to travel with her, it was easy to underestimate the breadth of Ina's knowledge, the keen intelligence that she'd also bestowed on her son. So Alice could talk about Freud's Dora's case, Dora case. She knew Ina would understand its appeal, given the sight of her own suffering. He loved the jewel case in Dora's dream, she said. Female genitals, of course, Freudian gold. <laughs> Alice had been rereading the case history recently, scribbling reposts in the margins. When Dora bucked up, she was quite feisty, really, for her age in the Times. He just gave further interpretations, but he was hard to argue with. The ideas sound ridiculous, but they slot into this impenetrable kind of monolith. What was it he'd said about Dora's purse? He reckoned Dora confessed her masturbation to him by playing with her reticule in an analytic session. Maybe Dora's small bag had been beaded or embroidered like hers. What was inside Dora's purse? What was inside her own? Only fragments, it seemed. Disjointed body parts and ideas rubbing and sliding against each other. Pain stitched through seams and pleats. It's beautiful. You write beautiful poetic prose, Joe. It's one of my, you know, as a poet, something that so appealed to me. We have a question um, about the process of publication from Rachel, who has said, was it easy or hard to get your book published? Did you have an agent or what was the process for getting this amazing book um, out into the public? Thanks, Rachel. It was, it was I think, um, from what I've heard from other people, relatively easy, but it felt incredibly hard. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> I submitted it to two awards and, and nothing uh, to uh, unpublished manuscript awards and didn't get anywhere with those. I submitted it to one publisher who um, said no, but was actually quite interested in the memoir. Um, and I submitted it to one agent who said no. And what happened was that I asked that the, well the agent offered that um, that they really that the that they could identify with Arthur, but they really 
yeah, they'd felt a bit detached. They really wanted to like it, but they'd felt detached um, from Alice, I guess, to all the rest of the novel. Uh, and when the publisher rejected it, I asked them, well, which part of it did you think worked the best or, or you like the most? And, and um, the publisher said, oh, well, oh, Alice, absolutely, the modern day one, absolutely. So I guess the lesson for me with that was like, I, I thought, well, I'm not going to change anything. Yeah. I'm just going to, so then I submitted it. Oh, that's right. So I had a list and Natasha Lester came up with this really great idea where you have a list of the thing you're going to do next when you're rejected. So I had this quite long list and um, I'd done a few of them. So the next one I spoke with Georgia at um, Fremantle Press, I was fortunate I had some, a little bit of a kind of connection through being part of the Four Centres Emerging Writers Program. And I wanted to talk with her about whether I should keep working on it, maybe submit it for the Hungerford Award. She was great. She said, look, um, well, submit it now. Cause I said, I just don't know if it works. I'd only had Susan read it and she, yeah. she was lost kind of too now by this stage we, we'd lost that kind of perspective yeah so um and then so when I was wrong about it I was expecting a rejection because of my list of rejections so I was like uh, <laughs> like I was really grumpy um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to kind of like oh my god so yeah so that so yes I think that that was um so no agent uh, I think that I, I probably would have kept trying agents, publishers, whatever, but I was very fortunate that it didn't take too many submissions. That, like I said, I do lose confidence easily. So, um, yeah. It's I, important, though, sharing, even sharing that experience, I think, is really important because, you know, you see a beautiful book like this and you just assume that, you know, it was an easy ride and it's, you know, everybody loved it. But, um, you know, publication is often a hard road. And if you know you've got something good, you shouldn't change it, which is clear with you getting a little bit of feedback. And often you don't get feedback, but the fact you were lucky and got feedback and they both said opposite things sort of suggested, well, actually it's just a personal like or dislike for it rather than something flawed in the narrative. Um, I guess if you had lots of readers come back to you and say that there was one bit over and over and over that didn't work, exactly. that, that's the point at which you would want to, rewrite it or change it or whatever but yeah when you get different points of view I think you have to stick your ground I think you do and this is back I mean I finished it in August 2018 so this is some time ago so I mean I was slow in how I submitted it as well um, but again we just find our own way with that don't we some people kind of just act fast and submit and submit and submit I tend to be slow I have to gather my confidence again mm. and then yeah. It's interesting you said that about manuscript competitions because I think that they're very difficult to win because, you know, you get a lot of people and there's only one winner. So sometimes that's not the best way to go no, about publication. And it can be dispiriting. I think you have to kind of, for me, like I, I tried a range of different things. Cause, yeah. Cause, yeah, it's a different yeah, it would work. Um, I guess because you talked about the fact it had a different title and I think that the title is such a unique one and so fascinating and you know I love metaphors so um, I wanted to yeah ask you about I have a rook and I believe that you're going to read um, the passage that refers to the rook as well um, and the idea of symmetry and bodies and and yes. everything that it, why did it become when did you change title? Um, Oh, I, I changed it before I submitted it. Yeah. And it was because Silk Purse just began to feel too obvious to me, partly. Mm -hmm. And it was because Rooks had just happened to become more and more central. And again, that was one of those things that sort of just gradually happened. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know I was really doing it. Uh, the Rooks started to become a very good metaphor for where Arthur was at. But I gradually realised too, when Alice is... Um, exploring her own sense of her body she has this idea of two bodies where she talks about the the body that the whole that's whole and symmetrical that we see in reflections and in the gazes of other people and in the people around us mm -hmm. and then there's the body that's formed by sensation which is fragmented and so on and that's why when she was talking about the silk purse she was talking about that fragmentation and I realized that the rook was something to do the, with this as well that um the fragmentation that Arthur feels as well and Emily feels because Arthur has quite a, a big loss yeah. sort of early in the book. So, um, and uh, the Rook increasingly, I guess it, it's not giving anything away really to sort of say that a lot of the Rook became about also creativity and this yeah. idea of the two bodies. So what is it, if we are fragmented, what is it that can make us whole? 
really, mm -hmm. um, which is what I was referring to with the silk purse yeah. as well. Um, so really, this is just the first, this is quite early in the book, page 33, and it's just Arthur, he's had uh, quite, a, quite a big loss in his life and he's walking, he, he now walks a lot alone, which is what my father used to do as oh. well. And in the same place, um, the nays, he used to walk on the nays, yeah, with his dog. Just oh, like wow. A, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Arthur, he, he, eggs, he collects eggs. He gathers the eggs alone, blows each until his cheeks are sore and nestles the empty, empty shells in straw. His remaining school friends think he collects them to compete with other students or to admire, admire his bounty. And it's true he finds the eggs beautiful. He likes to take them from the shells of his tiny study to cradle them, his breath slow, feeling their curves soft against his skin. Smooth olive-toned nightingale eggs, the brown spotted kestrel egg found in an abandoned crow's nest, lustrous white kingfisher eggs, sedge bird eggs, pale brown mottled darker, and his prize, the rook egg. When he holds it, that egg, marvelling at, at its glossy green-blue wash, the dark tracing like a language he cannot quite understand. He is again in the elm thicket against the path to Herdley, digging irons into bark, clinging to the giant tree's branches as if he were a rook himself. One day returns to him now, a day that was different to the rest, a day when he'd had to think things through. He'd hoisted, hoisted himself past clusters of crimson flowers, he remembers, lifting his head above a branch coming suddenly face to face with something he could, he could not make sense of. It took a full moment to understand it as the eye of a rook and in it the reflection of his fragmentary form. He backed away from the bird as she hunkered down on her eggs and made his way down the trunk, vowing he'd leave this family at least alone. That's so lush and beautiful. What amazing, amazing writing. I like that idea of the you know, being out there and, and noticing all of the poetry around you on these walks. It's it's very, very beautiful. And I guess um, we're running out of time. If anyone's got a question um, that they want to ask Joe, if you can pop it into the chat and I will ask her. But um, I just know from my own experience, um, so I gave this to my Nana. My Nana is um, 91 and she loved it. You know, she is quite a progressive woman herself, but loved, you know, the, the differences of the time and the strength of the women. I gave it to my husband who loved it. I don't think there's anyone that won't enjoy something. Like it's not, it, it just transcends kind of every boundary to appeal on different levels to different people. So I think that's pretty amazing because we often pitch a book to a certain kind of part of the community, but just in my own life, me and my Nana and my husband, and, you know, it's it's a winner. <laughs> Joe. Oh, that's so good. It's it's just, you know what it's like when you're working on something big like this and you just lose, I, I just have no idea. I had no idea if it worked. I had no idea if anyone, you know, if it'd be too much for people, if it would ever get published. So to hear that, yeah, I'm really thrilled to hear that. Thank you. Um, I'm so pleased your Nana liked it. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she did. And um, and I have another, I just have a final question from the chat. Uh, yeah. Was the decision to set the novel in two eras deliberate from the beginning? What did you mm. intend to emphasise by comparing the two of them? So that mm. amazing juxtapositions that occur, mm. were they always there or was there was there one period before the other? So Arthur and uh, that that timeline did start first, just because of the, wow, the next that's shot that I was talking. That. Yeah, I think I just sort of thought really straight up though. I really want to have a modern perspective as well. So that was a deliberate the decision that you know the, the historical one emerged spontaneously. Then I thought I also want this kind of reflection on it because what had happened is that from my own research, I'd really identified that not a lot had changed. I was very interested in the way that women have continued to be silenced, um, including internally as well. You know, it's like the silence is within the infrastructure of how we think and within our society. And so I really, I wanted to look at how things have changed. I mean, people, they can be quite um, raunchy. They can be yeah. open with their language and so on. But in many ways, the fact that it still can't be talked about means that nothing's changed. Um, and I also wanted to show, um, which does come into the book, that even in the 19th century, there were some early, early gynaecologists and nerve doctors who actually described it very accurately and very sympathetically. 
And really that then um, when Alice is talking with one of her friends about this and they sort of say what happened, well, Freud came along. So really in some ways we were getting somewhere and again, not yeah. bad more than Freud, but you know. Yeah. So it was so yeah, that was just really critical to me to kind of show there are things that still need to be done. Wonderful. Well, you know, I think you everyone should forego an Easter egg and and buy, buy a rook for Easter because I think it's gonna be a better present than an Easter egg. Um so I think that that I might hand back um to better red than dead because I think we've hit our capacity for this wonderful chat. Okay, I'll just say thank you to Cassandra because um, you've been just so wonderfully generous with your time and in preparing for this. I love to look. No one, no one does a note take like I. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew you'd find you'd appreciate the poetry in it as well. I just it's so like, beautifully written. I mean, you could pull whole bits out and and they would be prose poems. You know, that's oh, for wow. me my personal love of that. I'm like, oh, that is gorgeous. It it's Good. beautifully written. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone all for coming. It was such a wonderful conversation. This book is excellent. Please come into the shop and buy it or go through our website. Um, and just thank you both so much. It's been such a wonderful evening.